Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to BC213, our course on the end times. Thank you all for connecting to the class. Um, may I request somebody to please pray and then we will get started. Father, we thank you for this day, for this time, Lord. We come to your presence and we worship you, we praise you, Lord. We submit you, your, in this class into your hand, Lord Jesus, as we're going to learn about your word, Lord. Help us to learn deeply, Father. Thank you so much once again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So last week we um, just introduced chapter 4, which is an overview of... Uh, of the world events, coming world events, right? So what we want to do is, we in this chapter, we want to understand the sequence of events. How are things going to happen, all right? And um, now, uh, like we said in the beginning, um, there are people who have different positions. Like some may say, uh, the rapture will take place before the start of the tribulation, some may say in the middle, some may say in the end. And even in how some people interpret the book of Revelation, there are variations. Right? So there are. So I'm not saying what we are going to learn is the only way. Right? So if you pick a book somewhere, somebody wrote a book, you read it and say, this is different from what I learned. <laughs> Don't be surprised. Because there are people who have Different, there are different interpretations or positions, so we are uh, we understand that. But uh, the approach we are taking uh, is that we will follow the book of Revelation as it is given in a chronological order. That means we are not going to change things hmm? as God revealed it, we will take it like that. Okay, so we will get to the book of Revelation. Uh, we will go through it chapter by chapter and we will follow the chronology of that. Saying that God gave it to John, Apostle John, in a chronological order and we will stay with it. We don't want to mix and match. Uh, sometimes some people move things around like, you know, for example, I just say, there are three sets of judgments. The, uh, uh, the bowls, the uh, trumpets. Let's forget now. Okay. My gosh. Sure. Anyway, so there are three sets of judgments. Um, bowls. Ah, the seals, the bowls, and the trumpets. Three sets of judgments in the Book of Revelation. Okay. So the seals, the bowls, the trumpets. Now, what some people do is they make this overlap as though it's all happening in parallel. But in the book of Revelation, it is given in sequence, one after the other. Okay. So we will stay with that sequence. We won't jumble it up. We won't make it parallel. I'm just giving one example how people change. So, uh, I will, so as we go through the book of Revelation, I'll explain, right? So, based on that, we will do this chart. This chart that I've given, that you're seeing on uh, uh, page 53. Now, based on the timeline or the sequence of events given to us in the book of Revelation, um, we will do this timeline. Okay, we will explain this timeline. But um, we are going to uh, start, and we're going to read a lot of scriptures. I, I want us to know where it is in the bible okay so don't just say oh yeah this will happen this no you need to know where it is right you need to show a chapter and verse and say because it is there i am saying this will happen and this will happen so we are going to you know turn into the scriptures and read so it'll take us a little bit of time but the purpose is that you know, we must know from the scriptures you know uh, where where it is said what is said therefore um you know we can say that Things are going to happen like this. So let's begin in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 12. Acts 1, 
6 to 12. And uh, somebody could read that for us. Acts 1, 6 to 12. Acts 1, 6 to 12. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons, which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand uh, gazing up into heaven? This uh, same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner, as you saw him go into heaven. Mm. So, this is, you know, uh, 40 days after the resurrection of Jesus. They are all on top of the Mount of Olives. And the uh, uh, the uh, the disciples are asking, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So right now, the kingdom is being governed or controlled by the Roman Empire. Romans, they are all under the uh, the the Romans. So they are expecting the Messiah to come and be king. They are expecting the Messiah to come and give them control. Right now, Jesus is getting ready to go, and they are still under the control of the Romans. So they're asking, Lord, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? When are you going to give it into our control? Then Jesus says, It's not for you to know the times the Father has, meaning that's going to happen, right? But it is, it is that timing is in the Father's hand. Now, what is going to happen? You are going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you are going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. That means this is what's going to happen. The Holy Spirit will come on you. You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. So this is what we refer to as the church age. The time when the Holy Spirit is empowering believers to be witnesses. So one main reason why we are here is to be witnesses. And then as Jesus is, uh, you know, Jesus is on top of the Mount of the Olives, these people are there, the disciples are there, and Jesus in front of their eyes is just going against gravity, he's going up into heaven. As they see him go, the angels are saying, men of Galilee, we're giving you announcement. The same Jesus will come in a similar manner as you have seen him go. That means he is going, he went up into the clouds, he's going to come. He'll come, the same Jesus. Right? And uh, he will, and, and Zechariah chapter 14, uh, 12, 13, 14, we will look at it. He is going to descend on the Mount of Olives. And Zachariah already prophesied. Okay. And the angels are saying, He will come in the same way you've seen Him go. He will descend. But from now till that time, our responsibility is we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to be witnesses. So the church age. Okay. So Jesus is coming back. The angels announced it. But it is in the future. Now we have a responsibility to, to preach the gospel, take the gospel to all the nations. Okay. Now, when we go to the last chapter of Revelation 22, I just want us to just think about this a little bit, because after the Lord gives you know John all the details of what is going to happen, 
In Revelation 22, I will read these verses, these few verses that we've highlighted, where Jesus keeps saying, I am coming quickly. This is AD 90. <laughs> Today we are 2024. Almost 2,000 years. That time what he said, John, you wrote all these things. I am coming quickly. So for some of us, we're like, Lord, what is this? 2,000 years. And you said you're coming quickly. But that is when we have to remember that God's, for, for God, time is very different. Right? Like Peter says, one day is like a thousand years, a thousand is years is like one day. It doesn't matter for God. For us, it's yeah, people we hardly live a hundred years. So you know, we don't see beyond hundred years. But he said, I am coming quickly. So let's read those verses. Revelation 22. Six and seven. 12 and 13, 2021. Somebody could read these verses for us, please. Revelation chapter 22, verse 6 and 7. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angels as represented to show his bond servants the things that must soon take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is the one who heeds and takes to the takes to heart and remembers the word of the prophecy contained in this book. Mm -hmm. Then 12 and 13. Sorry. And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Mm. 2021. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Hmm. So in this last chapter, three times, Jesus saying, I am coming quickly. John, you wrote it, written all these things. I am coming quickly. They must have thought, okay, within two years he'll come. <laughs> or maybe... You know, 20 years, something. Jesus said, I'm coming quickly. So we are here 2,000 years afterwards. And uh, we haven't seen the fulfillment of all that is written in Revelation yet. And we haven't seen the Lord come as he has ascended. We are still waiting. But we can say, for God, uh, he's outside time. So... What may seem so long for us, for him it's nothing. Okay, But what we can do is we can study, we can understand how close are we and what are the sequence of things we can expect to happen. That's what we're going to see. Right? So let's go step by step. The first thing, so we are now in the church age where the Holy Spirit is upon us and we are witnesses for Jesus to the ends of the earth. So the first thing we are expecting is the rapture of the church. And uh, we will read this. This is described for us. Paul the Apostle wrote about this in two places. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. Somebody could read this. Usually in funerals, or I wouldn't say usually, but always in funerals, we read these passages just to remind people that this is the hope we have. First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Somebody could read it for us, please. First Thessalonians chapter 1, chapter 4, verse 13. For we do not want you to be unformed believers about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as others. Do you have no hope? For, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. What happened? Yeah, if we believe that Jesus died and rose if again. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God 
in the same way by raising them from the dead will bring with them those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For we say this to you by the Lord's word that we who are still alive and remain until coming of Lord Jesus will in no way precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shouts of command, with the voice of the archangel and with the blast of trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will simultaneously be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air again. So we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort and encourage one another with these words. words. All right. Thank you. So um, we will read the other one in First Corinthians 15 uh, shortly. But I just want to point out. The Apostle Paul, in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, uh, one of the common themes is about the coming of the Lord, the return of the Lord Jesus. Uh, you see it throughout, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 through uh, 2 Thessalonians. You see it. And as he is telling the believers about the coming of the Lord, he gives this very detailed description of what will happen. Very detailed. So this is how it's going to happen. Right? We will look at it. But in a sense, he's saying, the Lord will descend. This, he will bring with him the spirits of those who have already died in Christ. Hmm? That means, all, at the time of his coming, all the believers who have already died where are their spirits not floating somewhere here bible college <laughs> no their spirits are with the lord their spirits are with the lord the lord will bring with him uh, where is this yeah verse 14 god will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. That means those who have died with him. God will bring with them. Now in what way? Only the spirit. Because body is gone already. It's become disappeared. That means spirit is with God, with the Lord. So when Jesus is coming, their spirits will come with him. That means they're all there in heaven with Jesus. So he's bringing with them. And this is the moment when they will receive glorified bodies. And at that moment when the Lord is coming, we who are alive on the earth, believers who are alive on the earth at that time, will receive the, the, the bodies will be instantly changed, will become glorified bodies, and we will be caught up. And we will meet the Lord in the air. That means He is not landing is coming in the sky spirits of those who have already died are coming with him they receive glorified bodies we are alive on the earth our bodies are changed we go up and we meet him in the air and then what happens he says so shall we be ever with the Lord. That means there is no indication that he's landing. Coming, meeting in the air. Going to be with him. You understand the picture? It's a very clear picture. Hmm? Now, it is from first... So the word, some people say rapture. That word rapture is not in the Bible. Correct. You read this here. You don't find the word rapture here in English. You don't find it here. It's true. Yeah, it's not there in the English Bible. But that's when we say the word rapture is coming from the Latin word. Right? So in the notes you can see from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Uh, uh, Simul, I don't know Latin. I'm just saying reading some few words. <laughs> Simul Rapimor. That means we are simultaneously together. 
I think your word, your translation uses the word simultaneous, right? So that's the word here. Simul rapumor. So from that word rapumor, we are getting rapture. So it is there in the in the lang in the Latin translation. It's coming from there. So some English words have the root in Latin. So that's why. Yeah, it's not there in the English, but it's coming from the Latin word from First Thessalonians four seventeen. So when we say rapture of the church, we are saying it. We are talking about this moment when we will all be simultaneously caught up together. This is what we are talking about, rapture. So no problem with the word. The rapture word is not there in the New English Bible. It's coming from the New uh, Latin, and this is what it means. It means we will all be in a moment simultaneously caught up to meet the Lord and being there. Okay. There are some more things, some more information he gives about trumpets and all that. We'll come back and study that. But let's also read chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 51 to 58. Okay. So let's go there and then we will look at this because there are other, there are other things that we need to understand. 1 Corinthians 50, 51 to 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 58. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkle, twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for so the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruptions, and this mortal must be must put on immort immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on incorruptibility, then shall be brought to pass. The saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O heads, where is your victory? Mm -hmm. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my behold, brethren, we stayed first immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Mm. Okay. So these two, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, and 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 58, actually a lot of this chapter, 15th chapter, we didn't read the whole chapter. But these are parallel passages. That means they are talking about this moment when believers are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. He's giving us more details. What are some things we'll point out? So he's saying, we will all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. This mortal will put on mortality. The dead will be raised incorruptible. Right? That means the Lord is bringing with them all the believers who have died. And the moment they will receive incorruptible bodies, and our mortal bodies will put on immortality. That means it will be, bodies will become just like the physical body, just like the body of Jesus after his resurrection. Okay, we will read Philippians 3, we will look at it, where uh, it says, you know, we will be like him. Right? So we'll read that. But our bodies will become like that glorified body. So that glorified body can pass through walls. It is it is out it operates outside of this. It can operate in both realms, natural realm, because people can see it, but yet it is not limited by the laws or the rules of this natural realm. So Jesus went up like against the law of gravity. He came through the wall. But at the same time, he told uh, Thomas, Thomas, you touch me. You see. And when he appeared again many times, people saw him. And then, you know, John 20, when he appears to uh, his disciples, John 21, when they've gone fishing, they see him standing. 
Yeah, so it's not like some something that's floating on the sea, they form, right? That is a physical form to this. So it is made of, uh, we just say, it's made of a different kind of material, like diff it's a spiritual material. We don't know what it is, right? It's incorruptible. This physical body is corruptible, decay. But that material will not decay. Incorruptible material. But it's real. It can, it can operate in two realms, the natural and the spiritual. Right? So that's the kind of body we will receive. And it will happen in that instant. The other thing we point out is in both these passages, we read about trumpet sounding. Right? Now, uh, important, we must not confuse these trumpets with the seven trumpets that we read in Revelation. Because the seven trumpets in the book of Revelation, each trumpet is very clearly stated what will happen. And these are having to do with judgments on the earth. These two trumpets in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15 have to do with the believers meeting with the Lord, with their bodies being changed and then meeting with the Lord. That's what these trumpets are sounding. Okay, so don't confuse the two. Because some people will take, oh, two trumpets here. Okay, let me go in Revelation. I see seven trumpets. Under which trumpet I'll put this? Then they plug this under that trumpet. Full confusion. <laughs> you know, so... Sometimes people do that. No, no, no. Keep them separate. Like we said, there are in the book of Revelation, there are three sets of judgments, seven each seal, bowl, trumpet. So, seven, seven, seven. Keep it like that. Don't take this and put it there. No. This one is separate. So, we see two trumpet sounds one, when the Lord descends. On the trump, trumpet sound. This is in First Thessalonians, chapter four, uh, verse sixteen. There will be the archangel sounding trumpet of God, and he's descending. He begins his descent. Okay, that's one trumpet. Then, in uh, First Corinthians fifteen, he says. Uh, verse 52, right? for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised. So here's another trumpet, which is the last trumpet, verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised. So some people say, well, why is it called the last trumpet? Meaning, it is, uh, so, and I've given reference somewhere, how trumpets are used, um, you know, to talk, announce something. And this last trumpet is sounding the end of the church age. Finished. No. Dead are raised. All the believers are raised. Bodies are changed. Going up. So there's a trumpet that sounds. The Lord is descending. He begins his descent. And the last trumpet. This is the last announcement. Our bodies are changed. Everybody, all believers, receive a glorified body. And they meet the Lord in the air. So in the Old Testament, you'll find that trumpets are sound. sound um, uh, trumpets are blown to assemble the people. When they assemble the armies, people together, they blow the trumpet. Then everybody assembles. So this last trumpet is the assembling of the church, all believers. Those who died will come with the Lord. Those who are here will be caught up. Everybody is having glory, glorified bodies. We are all in one way assembling with the Lord in the yeah, last trumpet. It's the close of the church age. The church has been assembled to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Okay, so don't confuse these two trumpets with trumpets in Revelation. We will read that. Prince, your question. Uh, 
so pastor uh, as we are talking about two trumpets right like so is it like one trumpet will be at the starting of coming and another trumpet at the end of closing yeah is it like two trumpet yeah so one trumpet will sound when the lord begins his is like okay you can imagine just imagine okay i'm just imagining i'm not saying the chapter and verse the time comes the father says to the lord jesus time has come we have to go he stands from his throne ready to go then gabriel <laughs> and then he begins his descent that means this is something big happening so the angel, the shout of the archangel from one archangel i don't know gabriel michael i don't know who somebody shouting blow the trumpet because that moment nobody knows only the father knows so he might turn around time to go this stands up everybody say oh the lord is standing ready to go shout blow the trumpet then the lord begins to descend is coming through the clouds but this time he's not coming with the armies of heaven like in revelation 19 that time revelation 19 is he is coming on a white horse with his robe dipped in blood with a sword in his hand and with the armies of heaven very different here he's coming with bringing those who have fallen asleep with him there's no He's not writing, Paul is not writing about coming on a white horse with a sword. And, you know, he's not like that. He's not coming to do battle. Revelation 19, that time he's coming to do battle. He will strike the nations with the rod of iron, with the word of his mouth. Now he's coming quietly. And there's one more trumpet. That second last trumpet is everyone is there. Meet him. That's the last trumpet. It's the end of the church age. Church is taken. Then we are going to be with the Lord. I. See, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? Sometimes maybe we will hear something. <laughs> something to shake us. Because in the spiritual realm, there is no distance, like, you know. So example, I'm just thinking, see, when Saul was going on the road to Damascus, uh, a lot of people were with him. There was a bright light. He fell to the ground. So it says, Saul and the people, they saw the bright light. But only Saul heard the voice. Others didn't hear the voice. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting? Then he says, who, who are you, Lord? He says, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. You go to Damascus. I'll tell you what to do. That only Saul heard. So I'm thinking, uh, maybe the sound of these two trumpets, only believers will hear. Huh? Other people won't hear. Maybe the first trumpet we might hear saying, suddenly one alarm is, you know, suddenly one alarm, who, what is that? We hear in our spirit, get ready. Like within the twinkling of an eye, before we can even know it, everything happens. The bodies, our bodies are changed. Suddenly we are in the, in the clouds, meeting the Lord in the air. Right? So I don't know. Uh, it's quite possible we, we may hear the, both the trumpets, but it happens so fast. Um, yeah. Let us read some more scripture related to this whole thing. Um, John 14. 1 to 3. Now I'll take questions from the online students uh, just in a few minutes after we read some scriptures. John 14. Verses 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, 
I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Mm. So Jesus is very clearly saying, I'm preparing a place for you, huh? a mansion, meaning nice big place I'm preparing. And I'll come again, I'll receive you so you can be with me. So this is once again why we say the rapture of the church must happen. Because he says, I will come again, I will receive you, and you will be with me where I am. If you read about this, the second coming of the Lord in Revelation 19 and Revelation 20, there the sequence is, he comes, he destroys um, the Antichrist, the armies of the people, and he is here on earth, he establishes his kingdom. Then, what about these mansions? We won't get to see. Because if the rapture happens at that time, example, or we go meet the Lord, he says, come, 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 come to Armageddon. <laughs> have to, you have to fight and fight all the people, then we are here. He says, Lord, what about the mansions? But he said, I'm preparing mansions for you. I'll come, I'll receive you. And I'll take you to those mansions, so that where I am, you will be there with me. So that has to happen, which will not happen if the rapture of the church took place at the end of the tribulation in Revelation 19 and 20. It won't happen, because the sequence is, he comes to the earth and he establishes his kingdom here on earth. Then how we will see the mansions? So that's why we say, the rapture of the church has to be a separate event. It has to happen sometime before. When can it happen? Then we are saying, okay, we understand the meaning of the trumpet. The trumpet means the assembly, the gathering together. We are putting all the pieces together. So this is what makes sense. That he will come, take us, we'll be with him during the seven years of tribulation. We'll give some more reasons, you know, more reasons why we say the rapture of the church takes place before the tribulation. We'll give more reasons. I'm just pointing out one by one. Here are the reasons why uh, we are saying it has to happen before the end of the tribulation. Okay. Let's also read some more uh, verses. If Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that will be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Mm. So this is where we get the revelation that our bodies will become like his glorious body. So what will this uh, immortal glorified body be, it'll be like the body of Jesus. They very clearly stated right, that our body will be transformed to be like his glorious body. So the body that we have at that rapture that Paul has written in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, that glorified body will be like the body that Jesus had after he was raised from the dead, that spiritual body. Okay. Second Corinthians 5, we'll read one more passage. 1 to 4. Second Corinthians 5, 1 to 4. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a house from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. If indeed Having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, for further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed by the life. Mm. Right. So he's talking about the difference, right? In this body, this tent, we are groaning. 
uh, there is all the pain, there's all the, you know, all things. But we are going to have a body um, which is full of life. And it is a body where uh, it we are clothed from heaven. It is a house that is made uh, not with hands, but, you know, it's a glorified body. So just contrasting, earthly, spiritual body. Okay. So, uh, bottom of page 54, we've made these statements. Uh, the glorified body that we will have will be like the glorified body that Jesus had after his resurrection. It passed through walls. It could be touched and felt, could even eat. So we are going to be sitting at the marriage supper of the Lamb and eating. Again, we can't explain it, but it happened, right? Uh, it could ascend, it go against gravity, all of that. Okay, so let me pause here and see if there are any questions from the online class. Um, uh, any questions from the online students, anyone? Pastor uh, Ramilio. Oh, Ramilio, we can't hear you. Um, let me see. Can you hear me now, Pastor? Now we can. Okay. Um, my question is, um, I, when we are talking about uh, the people who are already dead, uh, will also be raised up with Christ uh, when uh, during his second coming as a glorified body. I mean, that's what we are talking, right? Mm -hmm. The people who are alive and also the people who are dead and buried, they'll be raised up back. Uh, so my question here is, so when the people die, uh, we believe that uh, uh, this, their spirit goes, I mean, goes to heaven uh, if they are believers. Yes. Um, so why again the, it is turned into a glorified body? Uh, because when they are in heaven, how, in what? What form they are in? Uh, they are with Jesus. So, when they are in heaven, they it is the spirit and soul, the spiritual part of the soul that is there. But they don't have this body. So, example. If one of them were to come to our earth to say hello, we can't see them. Because they have only spirit and soul, no body. We can't touch them, we can't shake hands, we can't eat with them. Because it's only spirit and soul. Yes, yeah, spirit, they are with the Lord, but they don't have this glorified body. So God is going to give all of them and us these glorified bodies. Um, so, Pastor, if that is the case, um, we read it where uh, Jesus is on the mountain and he was praying with the disciples and they see Moses and Elisha uh, coming and, you know, talking to them. If they are spirits, how, do they, how did they recognize, uh, uh, you know, there is Moses and there is Elisha? Aren't they coming down in a glorified body to talk to them? So, what happened in Matthew 17 is a special event, which uh, it's referred to as Jesus was transfigured. That means, in that moment, God decided to do something. Temporarily, temporarily, momentarily, God gave, he, example, uh, let me put it like this. He took a moment out of the future and he put it into the present momentarily. So we call this uh, time travel. So example. It just I'm just making up. Don't go say pastor said time travel. <laughs> I'm just ex trying to explain this, right? He took a moment of time from the future and put it into the present. So that means Jesus' body was transfigured. That means momentarily 
he remember that time he was in a natural body a flesh and blood body like like what we have but momentarily on the mount of transfiguration his body became as though it was a glorified body and momentarily elijah and elisha received transfigured bodies meaning these glorified bodies momentarily god just did it at that moment but keep in mind Peter, James, and John have never seen Elijah and Elisha. You can show any old man from the Old Testament, they don't know who it is. You can put Noah, Adam in front of them, they won't know because they've never seen. So their recognition of Elijah uh, and Moses came through a knowing from the Holy Spirit. But the visibility of um, Moses and Elijah was some a work of God in that moment where Jesus body itself was transfigured meaning made like a glorified body Moses and Elijah appeared as though they would appear in the future with glorified bodies Peter James and John are watching this they're seeing and uh, they are receiving hey this is Moses you have never seen him say hello this is, this is you never, you seen, never him, seen him, no photograph, no DP, but say, say hello. They recognize who these people are momentarily. That's a work of God. And then it goes away. Right? And Jesus comes back to his natural body. So what we say is in the Mount of Transfiguration, a special event, that's how they were able to uh, recognize and see what happened. Okay, so one last question. Mm -hmm. um, so when Jesus is, I understand when we are living uh, and Jesus is coming for the second, we are glorified body and we go to Jesus. But when uh, he is raising already who are dead, I mean, that's how it is written in the Bible. Who are dead uh, will be, you know, rising up with God uh, when he comes. So what is the exact, what is it exactly happening? Because the spirit is already with Jesus. Is the spirit is getting a glorified body? Uh, you know, because it is mentioned that the dead will be raised. Uh, yes, that yes. is the part where, because there is no bone, there is no body only here. I mean, we don't even know who is there in which grave. So, what is exactly happening on the earthly perspective, or because the spirits of the people who are already dead are with Jesus, are they attaining the glorified body at that moment of of His second coming? Yeah, you can imagine it like this. At that moment, when the last trumpet or the second trumpet, the last trumpet sounds, the spirits of all these people who have died, who have gone to heaven, they are with Jesus, they are coming with Jesus, and this trumpet sounds. Suddenly, their spirits are receiving a glorified body. But it does not mean that mud from the ground is suddenly coming together and that mud is suddenly being changed and it's going up and you know because some of the, 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 the like you said the physical part we nothing is there we don't know where it is right some people would have died in the sea some people would have died on the mountain wherever we don't know so it's not about the, that that the physical mud actually being suddenly changed no right there because they're not coming, they're not landing on the earth. In the middle of the air, God clothes their spirit and soul with this body that is made of different material. It's like they're getting into their spacesuit. Right? Getting it. God is just putting it on them. And at that same moment, those of us who are here on the earth. We are living in flesh and blood bodies. For us, something happens. Suddenly, our bodies are changed. Now, how God does it, I don't know. I don't know whether there'll be suddenly this physical body drops to the ground and <laughs> it doesn't describe it like that. But suddenly, those of us who are alive, this body changes. It becomes of a different material and we are meeting the Lord 
with the other saints in the middle of the air. So how it happens in twinkling of an eye? So to answer your question, it's not that you know God is collecting the mud from the earth and changing it and giving them a body. No. The body is giving them a spiritual body, but it's called resurrection from the dead because they are now clothed with a body, but the body is immortal. Unlike, you know, when somebody's raised from the dead today, they're still raised in a mortal body, which will die again. But that body will be immortal. Okay. Okay, Pastor. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Let's go for a break. We'll be back, everyone, in 10 minutes. Thank you.